Good evening and welcome. I'm Dan Schluffman. I'm the chair of the community, the Jewish Community Relations Committee of the Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. We're proud to sponsor tonight's Congressional Candidates Forum. As J Jewish communal leaders, we believe in the importance of civic engagement and hearing from candidates for public office on issues of concern to our community. What makes tonight different from other forums is that the questions we'll be asking the candidates are framed through a Jewish lens. As Jews, we are a diverse people in terms of our political views our, and Jewish religious affiliations, but we are all inspired by the same Jewish values and care deeply about core issues like the US-Israeli relationship, the rise of hate and anti-Semitism, and the Jewish imperative to care for the communities most vulnerable. We have developed a list of questions which will be asked by representatives from our federation. Due to the limited time we have, we have with each of the candidates, we've asked them to deliver two short opening statements and to limit, limit their answers for each questions to two minutes. There are many questions we will not have time to ask tonight, including questions that some of you submitted through the, the, reg, through the registration page. We're gonna have, if the first half hour is gonna be with the Congressman and the second half hour is gonna be with the challenger. So it's now my pleasure to introduce U.S. Congressman Bill Pascrell, who represents New Jersey's ninth congressional district. Congressman Pascrell is a Democrat who was first elected to Congress in 1996. Congressman Pascrell has established himself as one of the leading congressional voices on protecting Medicare and Social Security for our seniors. He also uses his position to fight on behalf of a tax policy fair to New Jersey taxpayers and international trade agreements that look out for the, uh, for the American worker. Before being elected to Congress, Bill proudly served as the mayor of Patterson and as a member of the New Jersey State Assembly. He was previously a member of the Patterson Board of Education, a public high school teacher, and a college adjunct professor at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Bill has three sons, six grandchildren, and he resides in Patterson with his wife, Elsie. So I'd now like to turn the program over to Congressman Bill Pesquerel. Dan, thank you so much for that generous introduction. And I'm honored to be with the Jewish Federation. And I've been with you folks many times. And uh, the work that you do in the communities does not get enough credit. And I say that sincerely. Uh, they're tough times. We all know that. This is not for the faint at heart. Our leadership is very important than ever, and Federation always does its job. Tragically, the COVID-19 virus is again surging in America and the entire world right now. Millions are out of work, and many are struggling to survive. And I use that word because I picked that word. It says, it says a lot about where we are right now, survival. The foiling of an assassination plot against the governor of Michigan shows that right-wing domestic terrorism is continuing to fester and continuing to grow. Just before I came on uh, this TV show tonight and your program, I watched John Radcliffe, a Trump appoint appointee from the Congress of the United States. He's director of national uh, intelligence. He announced that they're, they verify that Iran and Russia are trying to interfere with our elections. Very specific. So the House Democrats have responded with urgency and the decisiveness, making it urgent. And I don't hear that word enough. We have repeatedly passed packages to help America weather this pandemic. We pass some aid packages that are critical. The Trump White House and McConnell Senate have done nothing. At times they have seemingly gone out of their way to make things worse. We are nearly five months, at the five months that the Senate has refused to pass new stimulus checks. Now programs have expired, many of them. Mr. Trump keeps rejecting our good faith efforts at compromise. And as we speak, Speaker Pelosi 
and Secretary Munchen are still having dialogue and negotiations about the latest package. Uh, they are also attempting and focused on installing a right-wing uh, individual, a, a, an extremist, a, a record shows that, to the Supreme Court days before the election. Uh, those who record, recorded are the promises that, that have uh, wound up insulting, insulting us on health care, the environment, and government accountability. By focusing on the worst public crisis in a century, the administration has let the virus stay out of control. We are not going to change the economic aspect of this situation until we get ahead of the virus. So in the crisis, especially the choice of New Jerseyans and country could not be clearer. I wanna conclude with one area, an area I know I have special importance to you. For the last week, Donald Trump has been attacking the governor of Michigan. Simultaneously, Trump and other top Republicans refused to condemn the psychotic and deeply anti-Semitic Hunan, their cult, and I think they act like a cult. In fact, 20 of these cult supporters are Republican nominees for Congress. This includes the candidate challenging me. For over 10 years, I've been sounding alarm about rising domestic extremism. Since 2001, I have made the security of minority communities and houses of worship my absolute top priorities, one of them. My own record standing up for protecting our vibrant Jewish community is strong. I'm proud of it. I'm fully committed to crushing right-wing domestic terrorism and anti-Semitic cults. If I go back to Washington, know that you'll have a champion. They're fighting extremism that threatens our communities. I thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Congressman. My name is Suzette Diamond. I am the Vice President of Financial Resource Development. Thank you for having us. My question has two parts. The pandemic has had a profound impact on our society creating an unrivaled health and economic crisis while fundamentally altering our societal norms. For Jewish Federation and our partner slash beneficiary agencies, the consequences have been no less drastic. First, what should Congress be doing to support Americans who are still out of work and in danger of losing their homes? And two, what do you propose to support the nonprofit sector? Suzette, thank you for two great questions. We have 26 million unemployed who've lost their benefits. That's pretty clear. Then we have 700,000 who have dropped out of the workforce altogether. Americans are struggling uh, to, make, to make the rent and pay the rent and mortgage payments. So over 8 million I've contracted COVID-19. These are over 220,000 dead Americans. And we've lost over 16,000 in New Jersey. This level of pain is impossible to capture in words. States and local governments are drowning in a budget crisis, none of their own making. I predicted this five months ago. We can't even get a dollar in this new package they're trying to negotiate for those governments, the state governments, this is when budgets come due. And how are the locals, the counties and the municipalities going to do this? The federal government sh shirked its responsibility. House Democrats acted de decisively and we passed two versions of the HEROES Act to tackle this crisis, to support our first responders that are out there fighting this battle every day to make sure that the governments are whole in, in state and local and, uh, capacities. Our legislation would provide another round of stimulus checks to restore the $600 in pandemic unemployment benefits and to extend the PPP to help nonprofits and small businesses to improve tax provisions for all workers. 
and allow loans for nonprofits and provide funds to ensure state and local governments, as I said a moment ago, that will not go bankrupt. So we have been working and we're trying to do more. But thank you for the question, Susan. Jonathan, you, I think you muted yourself. How about now? Perfect. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Sir. Thanks, Congressman. How so are my you? name is Dr. Jonathan Manga. I'm a member of the JCRC also. Here's my question. So anti-Semitism and hate crimes against Jews have been on the rise in this country. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are also spreading exponentially online including some like QAnon, which have gone from the fringes to the mainstream. In our own districts, white nationalist group recruitment flyers are circulating freely. A ringleader of QAnon was recently arrested in Berkeley Heights, and the Proud Boys emblematic black and yellow flag have been spotted at recent demonstrations in Wayne and Hapatan. What actions should you elect to Congress again would you personally take to combat anti-Semitism specifically and more generally to protect people living in America from discrimination and hate crimes? I think they're great questions and my record is my record, uh, Jonathan. I've laid it out very clearly and particularly in the venue that we're talking in tonight, the Jewish uh, Federation is more than just the name on a group of people. We've worked very closely on protecting all of our synagogues, and this is true of every religion. This should be a nonpartisan issue, by the way, Jonathan. I really, uh, I really feel very strongly about this. Uh, like most conspiracy theories, the, the QAnon uh, cult is based on anti-Semitism. There's no two ways about it. It's a disqualifying cult system. No one should stand with extremists who chant, Jews will not replace us. However, Donald Trump has refused to condemn this anti-Semitic cult or other domestic terrorists. In fact, he was repeatedly encouraged them, the Proud Boys, the Nazis, the white nationalists, QAnon, the KKK, the ethno supremacists, doesn't matter what they call themselves, I call it wrong. There is no place for that hate in our society and it should not be tolerated. We cannot ignore the threats from these extremist groups. Last year, I brought together federal, state, and local leaders, maybe you're at that meeting, to discuss how we can stamp out this hate. I have participated in events organized by the Federation on combating this hate. I've long led support of the nonprofit security grant program, which I helped write when I was in the Congress and in that committee. Because this vile style still exists in our communities, and we have ensured New Jersey has received millions of dollars of grants every year. We need protection, and these grants have helped, and I thank you for asking the question. Mark? Yep. Um, thank you. My name is Mark Zamek, and I'm also a member of the uh, Jewish Community Relations Council uh, Committee. Sorry. In 2016, President Trump pulled out of the JCPOA, better known as the Iran deal, without offering an alternative plan. If elected President Joe Biden said that if Iran returns to strict compliance with the nuclear deal, he'll rejoin the JCPOA. Do you think the, the Iran deal is really the way to prevent Iran's path to nuclear power? And if not, what things should the U.S. do to bring, uh, to contain this rogue nation? I think that's an excellent question, Mark. And I want to tell you very right from the beginning, I agree with Joe Biden. Uh, I'm concerned about Iran's threat to the United States. They're not good characters and good actors. And our allies in the region, like, like Israel, the agreement that Donald Trump unilaterally tore up was keeping Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. We know how, we know, we now have fewer tools to hold them accountable. And that's what the Iran deal, as it's so-called, was doing. 
we have once again seen the faults in going it alone. We need a multilateral approach in dealing with Iran. Like we had under President Obama, we need the international community to work together. We had a strong sanctions regime that kept Iran in line. I voted time and time again to impose tough sanctions on the Iranian regime. But Trump's um, move crippled our ability to snap back and into them back into compliance. I'm proud of my record of support for our ally Israel. I've always supported security assistance. As a proud co-sponsor of legislation to authorize military assistance with Israel, which passed the House last year. I'm also co-sponsoring a plan that includes 4 million bilateral grant programs with Israel to fight the virus. And thank you for asking the question, Mark. Dan? Hertz? There you are. <laughs> thank you, Congressman. My name is Daniel Hertz, and I'm a vice president with the Jewish Federation. Next month, the US Supreme Court will hear arguments challenging the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. If the ACA is overturned, more than 29 million Americans with pre existing conditions could lose their health insurance. Medicaid coverage for millions more could be affected. What are the key priorities that you have in mind to both reform the overall health system and address serious health disparity issues? in underserved communities and populations? Dan, thanks for this question. I, I was one of the original authors of the ACA back in 2009, being a member of the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, I'm honored to answer this question. Healthcare is a right, not a privilege. The ACA banned discrimination based on pre-existing conditions and gender. We forget very easily that before the ACA, women, for instance, were, a lot, were forced to pay higher prices for their health care. We've done away with that. It banned annual and lifetime caps, which hurt many people who needed serious operations, et cetera, all the way down the line. It allowed young folks to stay on their parents' plans through age 26. It was by no means perfect. And we've asked, acted to change it since 2009, unaccepted by the other side who's tried to suffocate it rather than plunge it into oblivion. The ACA slowed premium growth. Long story short, the ACA worked. But as you noted, the president and Republicans have been trying to sabotage it at every turn. They voted 70 times to shred it. Three years ago, they came within one vote. If you remember that famous vote early in the morning, they are in court right now trying to throw it out the window. They tried to suffocate it by taking away subsidies, by changing the mandates. And so what they did, what they couldn't do in court up till now, they were doing by this legislation when they had the majority. So, we should be moving towards guaranteed health care that provides comprehensive coverage for everyone and, and is cost efficient. I agree with Joe Biden that we need to build on the ACA framework. We need stronger subsidies and we need a public option, which I fought for and was unsuccessful in 2009. Universal health coverage is our ultimate goal. Every American, regardless of age, income, health status, should have affordable health care. I have legislation with Senator Booker to reduce disparities uh, in minority communities particularly that are poorly served in the health system. We've seen in the COVID how who's hit the most minority communities. I mean, those are the numbers. We're not making these up. The pandemic has brought more attention to the step to systemic differences in our minority communities. M mortality rates are much higher. Those numbers stand out in my mind, uh, Dan, stand out very, very clearly that we have two health systems in America. 
And we need to make sure without having the government take over in the whole kibosh, we need to make sure that every person understands they have a right to health care. And that's the direction I'm going in. We had an important hearing on this in the Ways and Means Committee uh, last year. And as the new chairman of the Oversight Subcommittee, it's my top priority. So Dan, I hope I answered your question and I thank you for asking it. Lori? Thank you, Congressman. How are my, you? Name is, my name is Lori Vader, and I am a proud member of the Board of Trustees for Our Jewish Federation. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Here's my question. Politics in this country have become fiercely partisan and bitterly divisive. How do you propose to restore faith in our political system and reach across the aisle in a spirit of bipartisanship um, in order to tackle our nation's problems? Well, Lori, I've, I've long tried to work across the aisle. My record is my record in 24 years. If you look at my legislation, most of it is bipartisan to begin with. And then I attempt to bring other folks to the table to sign on to it, Democrats and Republicans. I've had many Republican friends and colleagues in my 24 years. Most of my legislation has been bipartisan and I try to make every bill I work on bipartisan. It's how you get things done, I believe, in the Congress of the United States. I'm the co-chair of the Law Enforcement Caucus and I'm co-chair of the Fire Services Caucus, two very bipartisan groups. But there are some issues, some values I will not back off like equality and like democracy, you cannot compromise. My record is strong on working together where we can and keep on pushing where we cannot. I don't give up on anyone. And Lori, I don't give up on any issue. Uh, if I might say, and I think you'll understand, I'm a dog at these things. Once I got your pants leg, I don't let go because my job is not simply to speak. My job is to get things done. My job is not simply to lead to bumper stickers. My job is to show tangible evidence that I am doing my job and not an ornament sitting on a chair in the House of Representatives. So I thank you for asking that question. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I'm more than, I'm here. Thank you, Congressman. We really appreciate you outlining your positions tonight. We wish you the best of luck in your campaign. We appreciate working with you over the years and we look forward to it again to you be in Congress again. Many of the folks in the Federation I've worked with our offices. I am very proud of our staff at those offices who've never turned their backs on anybody. In fact, 15% of our work comes from out of our district. It comes from other districts because we get things done. So I wanna say from my chief of staff, Ben Rich, to my uh, local uh, director, uh, Richie Morales, and all everybody who works with us, we put quite an, and we put a great assemble of people together to do our job. So anybody who says we're not working, come to our office, come to see me. And I am never going to back off anything. Thank you, Dan, for having me today. I really appreciate it. And I'm honored to be here. Have a good evening. If anybody has questions other than what you asked, call me up. Okay, thank you. Nine okay, seven three. We'll make your email address uh, available to uh, Nine seven three. Thank you. So we're going to take, take a two minute break. And then we're going to reconvene with the congressional candidate, Billy, Billy Premche.
Hi, all. Please sit tight. We'll be starting the program once again um, in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, Mr. Pascrell. I wish it could be much better. Next time I'd like to debate in person, Mr. Pascrell. Hello and welcome back. My name is Dan Schluffman. I'm the chairman of the Jewish Community Relations Committee, at, which is part of the Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. Billy, before I ask you some opening remarks, I wanna tell you a little bit about our Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. Also, so I don't embarrass myself, I wanna just ask you how to pronounce your last name because I've been texting people and I'm not getting it right. I think it's Prempe, but I wanna make sure. No, try, try that again. Prempe? It's, it's Prempe, close enough, but it's Prempe. Say it again. Prempe. Prempe. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. So All good. We, re we represent a diverse community in terms of our political views and Jewish religious affiliations, but we are all inspired by the same Jewish values and care deeply about core issues like the Israel-U.S. relationship, the rise of hate crimes, the rise of anti-Semitism, and the Jewish imperative to care for the community's most vulnerable. Now it is my pleasure to introdu introduce Billy Prempe, the Republican candidate, no, still no good. The Republican candidate, that's why I'm not a public address announcer. The Republican candidate for US Congress from New Jersey's ninth district. Billy 
is a first generation American who was born and raised and still resides in Patterson, New Jersey. He served in the United States Air Force from 2009 through 2011, specializing as an aerospace ground equipment journeyman. For Billy, his love and respect of our country is of the highest priority. And there is nothing he would like more than to make American greater than it is today for our future generations. Billy has always been a vocal and an outspoken individual when it comes to politics. And he has a large social media following that supports him and that probably can pronounce your last name. We look forward to learning about Billy and what he intends to offer our community. We appreciate you being with us tonight to address the concerns we care most about. The floor is yours for opening remarks and then we will have questions from our Federation people. Um, thank you, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Daniel? Daniel, um, <clears throat> Daniel and everybody, um, a part of the uh, Jewish Federation, first off, I want to say uh, good evening and shalom. Um, I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to share my vision for a better America and a better world. And since my opponent refused to debate me after multiple, multiple requests in person, this is the closest we're ever going to get. So I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about what I would like to do in the Ninth District. Um, so similar to a lot of people in, uh, in the African in the African American community, you know, my parents, they raised me with values of being my brother's keeper. And I know that this aligns quite well with a lot of the Jewish teachings of Tikkun Olam. And um, we, all, we all need to work together. At the end of the day, one thing that America is lacking is uh, unity. And that's because of a lot of the political devi divisiveness that we have. Um, unfortunately, um, today, the partnership that the African American community had with the Jewish community back during the time of the Civil Rights Movement, um, it was a great and very powerful thing. The Jewish community walked hand in hand and side by side with the African American community, and they supported us, they fought alongside us, and they, they pushed us in the same direction uh, for the path of equality, which is something that I, I would love to see reignited and re-sparked again. Um, just like the Jewish community, the African American community, we've been targets of hate for simply just being born, being a specific skin color, or even practicing a specific religion. We've got a crazy rise of anti-Semitism and racism that's going on in the United States right now. And what we really would like, to, what I would really like to see, is um, our communities reunite together and solidify our bonds so that we can, you know, continue to to thrive as Americans like we usually do. Um, as the very first African American Republican and the representative of the 9th District, I intend to work very tirelessly to bridge the gap between the Republican and the Democrat Party to, to push for what the people actually want and get them the results that they're requesting, rather than just rattling a bunch of talking points. Um, we need somebody who can not only work with the minority community, Hispanics, African Americans, Jews, but we also need somebody that can get in tune with the younger generation, the generation that is at this point currently um, disconnected and a little bit not aware of what is going on politically in the United States. Um, I, enthusi I enthusiastically look forward to, to doing this and um, bringing more hope and more, um, more eyes to the younger generation in politics. Um, some of the things that really upsets me, though, um, with what's going on with our country is um, there's been a lot of racist, anti-Semitic policies that have been coming out, or, or, or should I say statements that have been coming out, predominantly from the Democrat Party that you don't really hear too many people speaking about. Recently, a lot of us African Americans were told by Joe Biden that if we, were, if we weren't Black, you know, if, if, we don't, if we don't vote for him, we're not Black, or poor kids are just as smart as white kids, or the Latino community is diverse unlike the black community. Um, statements like these, these are hurtful, this is divisive, and this is the type of stuff that really upsets me because Congressman Pascrell has never denounced any of these things once, yet he claims to be a champion for the African American community. I really look forward to a proper discussion with Pascrell at a later date when that actually will happen. Um, but once again, I wanna say thank you to the Jewish Federation for, for having me on your platform today. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Lori Bader. Nice to meet you, Lori. I'm a proud member of the Board of Trustees for our Jewish Federation, and thank you for sharing your words with us and for joining us tonight. Thank you. So our first question for you has to do with the pandemic, and the pandemic has had a profound impact on our society, creating an unprecedented health and economic crisis while fundamentally altering our societal norms. For the Jewish federations and our partner beneficiary agencies, the consequences have been no less drastic. What should Congress be doing to support Americans who are still out of work 
and in danger of losing their homes. What do you propose to support the nonprofit sector? So first and foremost, um, I believe that Congress needs to pass a stimulus bill right now. Uh, Congressman Pascrell and Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, they held up the CARES Act for well over a week and they put nothing but unrealistic demands on there only so that they can pass that same exact, or, or only so they can pass that same version of the CARES Act um, that they turned down a week earlier. And the problem that I have with that is that the Republicans were standing by to negotiate one of the most vital parts of that stimulus bill. That's the PPP replenishment, as well as as well as well uh, getting the stimulus checks to, un, to, to, uh, to the citizens of America, as well as extending the unemployment benefits. None of this actually happened. You know, Pascrell and the Democrat, and the, the Pascrell and these Democrats, they wanted to stuff our stimulus bill with nothing but large amounts of pork. And as you and I both know, that's not very kosher, especially for the American people. Um, what they want is, uh, you like that, right? They want trillions of additional funding, you know, for countless things that, that don't benefit the American people. They benefit everybody else but themselves. They're creating a Christmas list without actually getting us what we need. And the saddest part that I have is, you know, not too long ago, Congressman Pascrell was saying that you can call him, you can reach out to him at any time. And I think that's not true. In fact, I know that's not true because I watched as the unemployment, as watch, I watched as the unemployment benefits expired for millions and millions of Americans. In fact, there were a lot of people within the ninth district that were calling me because they couldn't get through to Bill Pascrell. And I have, full, I have all kinds of information to prove that this is true. People could not reach his office. He was never in his office. He never responded to emails. He never responded to phone calls. Yet people are calling me and I'm not even the congressman yet. And I was willing to put, to take time out of my day to help these people to do what Congressman Pascrell is supposed to be doing, acting as a congressman and helping the people. Mr. Pascrell, while you're in office, I implore you, I implore you to vote on a stimulus bill now. Forget about everything else, get people the money that they need, get them what is necessary. Because at the end of the day, our, our country can only sustain so much. And if we continue to have it in this, in this way, there, 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 there's not much left for us here, okay? Our, our economies have been shut down, businesses have been shut down, and people are struggling. It's time to stop playing politics and do what's right for the American people. Now, more importantly than all of this is the nonprofit sector, like you mentioned earlier in your question, is they play a very vital role in the growth of our nation. And that's why I believe we need to continue to, to make a safe reopening of our economy and our country. That should be our number one top priority. Because while we're able to do this, the, the only way that the, we're, we're able to continue these nonprofit organizations is with a strong and robust economy. And while we're closed, we can't do that. People can't can't you know be charitable and, and help people in the ways that they can because of what's been put in place because of all this uh, I, I would call it partisanship or division within our government. We need to meet in the middle and do what's right for the people and stop playing games with people's lives. You still there? All right, there you are. Thank you. Uh, and you're right, that pork is not kosher. No, not at all. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of pork myself, so. My, my name is Daniel Herz. I'm a vice president of the Jewish Federation. Uh, Anti-Semitism, as you mentioned, and hate crimes against Jews have been on the rise in this country. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are also spreading exponentially online, in, including some like QAnon, which have gone from the fringes to the mainstream. In our own district, white nationalist group recruitment flyers are circulating freely a ringleader of QAnon was recently arrested in Berkeley Heights, and the Proud Boys emblematic black and yellow flag has been spotted at recent demonstrations in Wayne and Hopog, uh, Hopog. What actions should you be elected to Congress would you personally take to combat anti-Semitism specifically and more generally to protect people living in America from discrimination and hate crimes? First and foremost, I want to be clear that I denounce and I detest anti-Semitism and racism in any kind of form. All right. This is something that I believe Republicans and Democrats, we can all meet on the middle on, even the independents and some of the socialists. We can all kind of agree that racism, anti-Semitism is not, it's not something that that is nice. You know, I myself, I've personally been subjected to racism numerous times. I know what it looks like and I know about it better than most people. In fact, Recently, a lot of the racism that's been coming my way is from a lot of liberals attacking me because I'm a black conservative. Because I'm an African American, I just tend to be a Republican. I've been I've received the most racism, literally all the racism from the liberals, from the left. Now, while social media has provided an outlet to spread hate 
And it's, it's a little bit disturbing that this is going on. What's more disturbing than all of this stuff is the blatant anti-Semitism that's coming from the members of the Democrat Party. Because Bill Pascrell, he stood in silence. He literally said nothing while the likes of Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and others have spewed some of the worst anti-Semitic and anti-Israel rhetoric that I've ever heard in years. OK, instead of actually coming out and condemning the freshman congresswoman's remarks and attempting to mentor them and put them down a better path, he requested to join the squad. Are you kidding me? Bill Pascrell and the Democrat Party have openly been hostile to the state of Israel for a long time. They've promoted boycotts, divestments and sanctions while using this as some of, while also using some of the most historically anti-Semitic slanders to do all this stuff. One of my main priorities for one, when I get elected, I'm going to focus on education and school choice now more than ever. The United States needs this now more than ever because a lot of people are not informed about what's actually going on in our government. People are not informed about this kind of stuff. So we, we put ourselves in a position where we elect the same people over and over and over again, primarily because of the letter next to their name. And they may not even have our best interests at heart. In this case, clearly, Congressman Bill Pascrell, you've been here 23 years. And you're not going to go and you're not going to condemn this kind of nonsense coming from people like Ilhan Omar. You're not going to condemn this. You want to join them. And you have the audacity to get on here and say that 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 you support the, Is the Israeli, the Jewish community. That sounds very hypocritical. That sounds very hypocritical. I will fight and I will never stop to fight to end racism and anti-Semitism before it ever takes root anywhere in the United States. And if I have to go across the world, I will. I've been there already. You know, when I get to D.C., I intend to use some of the strong. I intend to be one of the strongest defenders of Israel, the Jewish people and the state of Israel as a whole. You know, I would look to support legislation that would address the hate and discrimination against people from all creeds, all races, all genders, all across the United States. That is what I intend to do. I intend to stand by what I say. I intend to do what I say I'm going to do. And I don't intend to just make a bunch of talking points for the sake of votes. Because we all know the truth. We've watched you for 23 years, Mr. Pasquale. Next question. Hi, my name is Mark Zamek, and I'm a member of the Jewish Community Relations Committee. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I we all appreciate it. Thank you. Um, in 2016, President Trump pulled out of the uh, JCPOA, better known as the Iran deal, without offering an alter alternative plan. If elected president, Joe Biden said that if Iran returns to strict compliance with the nuclear deal, he'll rejoin the JCPOA. Do you think that uh, the Iran deal is really the way to prevent Iran's path to a nuclear weapon? And if not, what could the US do to contain Iran? Absolutely not. The JCPOA was one of the worst deals ever made for the safety and security of the state of Israel, United States, and the world. The Iranian government, and I'm not talking about the Iranian people, the Iranian government is a terrorist regime. This is a fact, okay? They funded terrorists all across the world, especially in the Middle East, mainly to, to threaten and attack the state of Israel. They've said numerous times that their goal is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. They're out in public chanting, death to America, death to Israel. They call the USA the great Satan, and they also call Israel the little Satan. I want to ask, why was it that Bill Pascrell and the Democrat Party supported giving the terrorist regime of Iran 150 billion American US dollars, as well as flying over 400, 450 million dollars in cash in military AC-130s. Why would you do that for a country that wants to take out Iran? Why would you do that? We all know this money was going to help terrorist operations. We all know that this was gonna to go towards killing Jews and killing Americans, yet they did it anyway. In fact, Qasem Soleimani was threatening and attacking American troops in Iraq. And when the, when the president came out and wiped this guy out for attacking us and threatening us, and he constantly waved their sword at Israel, we're the bad guys. No, no, Iran cannot, listen, Iran, they, they cannot, they cannot be allowed to, to come anywhere near nuclear capabilities, okay? They harbor radicalism, they harbor, they harbor terrorism, and they support terrorism, and they're constantly threatening the United States and Israel, and they've already done it before. They've already tried to attack us numerous times, and they're using this as an opportunity to strong arm the United States, and he supports giving them money. Listen, Bill Pascrell, he refuses to acknowledge the foreign policy and peace achievements of the current administration. And I believe that's a crucial mistake because peace is far more important than politics. It should never matter which side achieves it, whether it's Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Republicans or Democrats. None of that stuff matters. But it's always about the party with this guy. 
When I get to DC, I'll fight to keep those sanctions on Iran and I'll fight to support the great people of Iran that want democracy, that want freedom and that want peace in the world, especially in the Middle East. Because I met many Iranians that don't hate Jews. They don't hate Israel, but they have a terrorist government that's allowing this kind of stuff. We must defend our friends. We got to defend our allies in the Middle East. We got to defend our allies like Israel. And we got to be united in our opposition against regimes like Iran. I'm a military guy. Pastorell says he's a military guy. I've dealt with these people. They do not like Israel. And giving them money is hands down the most ridiculous thing in the world because it didn't prevent them from getting nukes. It did not prevent them from getting nukes. All it really did, and even when we put these restrictions in place, they turned a blind eye and continue to do it anyway. So no, I would not, I don't, I don't support that. The sanctions will stay. Next question. Hi, Billy. How are my you? Name is Dr. All right, my name is Dr. Jonathan Manga, and I'm a member of the JCRC also. Okay. So next month, the U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments challenging the constitutionality of the ACA. If it's overturned, more than 29 million Americans with pre-existing conditions could lose their health insurance. Medicaid coverage for millions more could be affected. What are the key priorities that you have in mind to both reform the overall health system and address serious health disparity issues in underserved communities and populations? Well, when I get to DC, first and foremost, I'm only going to support, I'm only going to support legislation that protects the Americans with pre-existing conditions. Anything else is a moot point. It's not even worth bringing up because the safety net, the, the safety net for people in need, like so many of my friends and family, so many people, a lot of my neighbors here in the city of Patterson, where I'm from, um, they need to be protected. Okay. So, and there's a lot of people with pre-existing conditions. Getting rid of that is not going to help anybody here. And for my entire life that Bill Pascal has been in power, He's done the most in an underserved community in my area that he's completely left behind. He claims to say that he serves our community, yet he's left us behind totally. And this could be because Bill Pascrell passed the ACA along with the other Democrats before they ever even read it. They didn't even read it and they passed it. We've seen the cost of insurance. <laughs> it's happened to me. It's happened to lots of my friends. It's happened to lots of business owners that I know. We've seen the cost of insurance shoot up about 100%, sometimes 200% in certain areas. Barack Obama came on television and said, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. That was a lie. I know lots of people, including my mother, who lost their doctor. Okay, Bill Pascal and the Democrats, they often like to tell about how the Medicaid expansion of the Affordable Care Act is, is a great thing and it's gonna bring quality health care to everybody that is affordable. But the thing is, that plan is only being accepted by a dwindling list of doctors. Not all doctors are accepting Medicaid. Most of them want private insurance. Now. The problem that I have with this is they're continuing to push this, they're trying to continue to push this uh, Affordable Care Act towards us without actually coming up with any other solutions. Because most of the people had no idea what was in the bill and they passed it anyway, what hurts me the most is they're supporting this primarily because it's something else put forth by the Democrats. At the end of the day, this is something that needs to be bipartisan, all right? There's people that are against this bill on the Republican side because Obama did it, and there's people that are against this bill on the Democrat side because, um, because they don't want Trump to get rid of it, whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, what needs to happen and what needs to happen with healthcare as a whole is, in my opinion, government needs to, does not need to be deeply involved in healthcare. And if it is going to be involved, we need to meet in the middle and we have to find a solution that's going to work for the best of the people. And I vow that when I get to DC, I'm not going to rest until there's a viable bipartisan healthcare plan that's ready to replace the Affordable Care Act that does cover and protect pre-existing conditions. And I will read the full entire bill before I pass it. Thank you. Hi, Billy. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure. My name is Suzette. <laughs> My name is Suzette Diamond, and I am the Vice President of Financial Resource Development. Politics in this country have become fiercely partisan and bitterly divisive. How do you propose to restore faith in our political system and reach across the aisle in a spirit of bipartisanship to tackle our nation's problems? You know, I, I truly appreciate this question because it's something that I believe is absolutely essential for, essential for our nation to grow, to, to grow and thrive. Because right now, you've probably heard me say it about eight or nine times that what our country needs now more than ever is not something from the Democrats, not something from the Republicans. We need something that's bipartisan where we can all meet in the middle. And you know, what a lot of people don't know is that I used to be a Democrat. I actually voted for Barack Obama. 
I believed in the hope and change that he spoke about. And that never really came through in the way that, that he explained. As someone who literally walked across the aisle politically, I'm confident that I'll be able to reach across the aisle because I know what it's like to be negatively impacted by the inaction of partisanship. Now, politics today is devolved into a power grab for lifelong politicians like Mr. Baseman Bill over here, who's been here for 23 years, instead of, the, instead of using it as a platform to do the people's work. There's a lot of grandstanding and, 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 and attacks being thrown at each other. Here in the ninth district, we got so many problems in the ninth district, yet Mr. Pascrell spends literally, I've counted probably 20, 30 tweets a day about the president. He addresses nothing about the violence that's going on in our city. He has nothing. He says nothing about the overdevelopment that's happening in numerous cities like Fort Lee and Palisades Park. He says absolutely nothing about the drugs that are coming into our city. He says nothing about any of this stuff. It's all about President Trump. It's all about the Republicans being bad. It's not. Worry about what's happening in the Ninth District. Worry about what's happening in New Jersey. Let the president handle his job on a federal level. You don't like him, do something in Congress. But sitting down and tweeting all day while doing nothing for the American people benefits absolutely nobody. You see, this guy's been here 23 years. And during that time, he's become a very, very wealthy man. A very wealthy man. How does someone who gets a salary of $145,000 as a congressperson end up with well over seven, maybe close to $8 million. This is based on 2018's numbers, so it's probably much higher than that. Get close to $8 million a year annually. How do you do that in Congress? Who is writing your checks, Mr. Pascrell? Instead of focusing on the issues, Pascrell, he sends thousands of these tweets. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. Because he's been openly auditioning that he wants to be a part of the member. He wants to be a part of the squad. He wants to join them. He wants to support people that are, that are, that are pushing anti-Semitism. He's supporting a president that has said countless racist things against, against the African-American community. Yet he claims to be a champion for the minority community. The people in Patterson, Mr. Pascrell, do not like you. They know you're a liar. And they know what you're doing. Stop using us for votes. Next question, please. I guess that's it. No, that's it. Well, but yeah. Well, actually, yeah. We have a. We do have about five minutes left. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna actually ask you a question. I'm gonna take the the uh, chair of prerogative here and ask you a question that you. I want to. I'd be interested to know what your answer was. Yeah. So I'd like to know why you switched parties and what things you think President Trump has done wrong. What made me switch parties? Yeah. What made me switch parties was after being in the United States Air Force, Barack Obama went into Libya and completely decimated Libya a country that was not a direct threat to the United States. It was not a direct threat to the United States Constitution. I joined the United States military to, to defend the United States Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Yet here we are utilizing our troops while Congress is in recess without a declaration of war. You go into Africa and bomb probably the closest thing to a first world nation in Africa. Gaddafi was not a saint, okay, by any means. But we go out there and we bomb. We go out there and we bomb Libya and destroy this. And when this happened, it led to the creation of ISIS. We're sending money to these moderate rebels who took all this funding and threatened everybody in Northern Africa, threatened everybody in the Middle East, threatened Israel. This is something that should have never happened to begin with. I did not sign up to join this. And when I started to see that the Democrat Party is pushing for more war, under President Trump, this is the first time in my entire life. And there's a lot of things I don't like about Trump, okay? I was, the, to, and to be honest, I never liked the guy until 2016, until I, until, I, until I saw him talking about wanting to bring the troops home, wanting to end the wars in the Middle East. How is it possible that we fought ISIS for over six years while I was in the military, yet the guy with the funny hair in the Golden Tower in New York from Fifth Avenue is the guy who came down here and took out ISIS in like, what, two, three months? Where was all this money going? We already know that our government gave billions of dollars to Iran and we support them because they're Democrats. This was the hope and change that he spoke about. The hope and change is about putting the is, was, was about putting Americans second. It wasn't about putting Americans first. And we started wars in the name of America. We overthrew governments. And then they said that this was for spreading peace and democracy, instilling a humanitarian no-fly zone over Libya. And here we have a president that everybody hates. What I don't like about him, like you asked, he tweets too much. I don't like that about him. But you know what? I've been alive 31 years of my life and the entire time that I've been alive, this is hands down the most peaceful I've ever seen the world. I don't see any, I don't see any nonsense going on in the Middle East. In fact, the president has brokered uh, peace deals between Bahrain and Israel, something I never thought I would see in my lifetime. Brokered peace deals between the UAE and Israel, something I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. When North Korea was threatening the world for decades, said that he was going to go attack America, he has the capacity to launch a nuke into Guam. That didn't happen because president said, what? I got a bigger button. 
We needed someone who was gonna be strong enough to strong arm our enemies, put them in their place and stop scaring us. Iran thought they were strong. They started attacking our troops. They threatened Israel and guess what we did? We took out Soleimani. We took out Abu al-Baghdadi. We took out ISIS in months. We, we told North Korea to sit down and for the first time in over 50 years, a United States president actually walked into North Korea. And we wanna say this is the bad guy. It sounds to me like the Democrat party wants war. That's what, that's why I don't like, that's why I left the Democrat party. And when I started to learn about the history of the Republican party and how the Republican party was founded by over hundred African-Americans in Ripon, Texas in the 1800s and how 29 of the first African-American congressmen in the 1800s were Republicans, about 29 of the first African-American senators were also Republicans. And the first African-American congresswoman wasn't until 1963. The first African-American congressperson wasn't until 1993. I was alive when this happened. The, the, the Democrat party created the KKK. They, they started the Trail of Tears where they marched Indians off of their reservations into the Western lands. They're the ones who created, they're the ones who supported uh, Margaret Sanger, who was an open racist that created Planned Parenthood and only puts these places in minority communities where she was on record saying that the Negroes and the Jews are weeds and need to be permanently eradicated from the face of the earth. Look this up. This is the part, this is what the party supports. Why would anyone in the right mind as an African-American or as a Jewish person, why would you be, why would you be a Democrat? This is why I am not a Democrat anymore, because when I learned my history and I learned my truth and I saw what our government was doing in the name of peace and sounding good and virtue signaling while they're actually destroying our country in our name, this is why I became a Republican. And people ridicule me for this. It's the liberals, the people in the suburbs, the people that are completely disconnected from what's going on in inner cities like mine and Patterson that are calling me the N-word, that are calling me a coon, that are calling me an Uncle Tom because I decided to do the research, yet they're siding with an organization that has done nothing but decimate the African-American community. This is why I'm a Republican. Thank you, Billy. Thank you very much for outlining your positions tonight and for taking the time to join us in our community. We wish Thank you. The best Mr. I want to say I want to say one more thing, Mr. Pascrell. Next time, let's actually debate in person because the people deserve to know the truth. The people deserve to know what your policies actually are, not emotion-based talking points. My policies are front and center. You tell people to look at your record. There is no record. There is no record. What have you done for the district? What have you done? Everything you've said has been a talking point. Everything you've said has been emotionally based, and the reason why you won't debate me is because you know that I know, and I've lived in Patterson for over 31 years. I've lived in here my entire life in the fourth ward, in one of the most impoverished areas of the area, where people are getting shot in our neighborhood all the time. You come out here and say you're a champion for Patterson. You are not, and you know it, and you say that you're a dog. Well, I'm a wolf, Mr. Pascrell, and 23 years is a long time. The wolf is coming to take out the dog. Thank you very much. Wish you the best of luck in your campaign. Thank you. Okay, and to everyone watching, thank you for joining our Congressional Candidates Forum. Make sure to fill in your mail-in ballots, fill them out properly and correctly, because they're not that easy, and, and have Republican. your voice heard. What's that? And vote Republican. <laughs> According to Billy, thanks again for being with us. According to facts. Good night, everybody. Appreciate it. Take care.